Hello, I thought I would do a video on how to hack and backdoor an IoT camera using a compromised firmware upgrade. The goal of this video is to show why having a secure firmware upgrade process that checks the authenticity of the upgrade is so important. As an example device, I will use a Wisecam version 2. I've got quite a few of these as I am using them in my IoT security training. Shameless plug, if you are doing security professionally and want to get into IoT and embedded security, I'm giving a hands-on training in February in Berlin that covers a wide range of attacks on real IoT devices. If you use the code YouTube, you get 10% off. You can find the link to that in the description. Now, what's nice about the Wisecam is that it's only $24 on Amazon and there's a large open source community developing open firmware for it, so you can buy it, hack it, and then use it as a decent surveillance camera. The camera is quite simple. It has a USB-A and a micro-USB port on the back, a rotating stand with a magnet in it, and on the bottom an SD card slot and a button. If you power it on, you can access it using the Wisecam app. Unfortunately, you can't seem to use it without a Wise account with the original firmware, but we can just build our own anyway. Now, let's get into the firmware. On the Wisecam site, we can download the latest firmware, version 4.9.5.36 in my case. Let's download it and jump to the terminal to unzip it. When I unzipped it the first time, I had a bit of a chuckle as they seem to have packed it on macOS without removing all the metadata files that Mac creates. Now, let's use our trusted tool Binwalk to see what's in the image. The first thing Binwalk detects is a U-image header, which is a common format used by the bootloader U-boot. This header already tells us quite a lot about the firmware. It was created on the 15th of November, the OS type is Linux and the CPU type is MIPS. This header also contains a couple of CSC checksums that we will have to update once we have modified the firmware. Next we see a kernel image was also detected, a 3.10.14 kernel, which is from October 2013. The next entry seems to be invalid, as can be seen by the minus one uncompressed size. The next two entries are interesting, two SquashFS file systems. SquashFS is a read-only file system that is commonly found on embedded devices. It's mostly used for the root partition, as having it read-only ensures that the device can't easily brick itself. As the last entry, Binwalk also found a JFFS2 file system. JFFS2, or Journaling Flash File System 2, is a file system that is commonly used with flash memory devices. Now, we could use Binwalk to successfully extract the firmware, but as we want to repack it later, I want to write my own script that unpacks and later repacks the different firmware components. So let's create a Wise Extractor Python script. Now, first we will create a very simple class that simply keeps the name, the offset, and the size of each part of the firmware. Next, we create an array of firmware parts with each part that Binwalk found. We insert the offset and calculate the size of the part by checking where the next section starts. For the last entry, we just take the file size minus the offset. Our script will take the first argument as a command, in this case unpack, and the second argument as the firmware file to read. Now we simply iterate over all firmware parts we defined and write them to separate files. You can find the final version of this script and also some other resources in the description. Now if we go back to the terminal and run the script on our extracted firmware, we get five files, uimage header, uimage kernel, squashfs1 and squashfs2 and jffs2. Now let's create a folder to clean up a bit, move in the firmware and our extractor and start unpacking the file systems. For the squashfs file systems, we can use unsquashfs-d with the target directory and the image file. And so let's extract both our squashfs file systems from the firmware. For the jffs2 file system, we can use Jefferson with the same syntax. As you can see, we now have three folders for all our file systems. Now, let's take a look inside of those file systems. The jffs2 file system contains a couple of folders with binaries, libraries and configuration files. The first squashfs uh, contains what looks like the root file system and the second squashfs contains a couple of kernel modules. Let's start by exploring the root file system's etc directory. So let's cd into squashfs1 out etc and uh, run ls to see what's in there. One very interesting file here is the shadow file. It's the file that is used to store passwords on Linux and Unix machines. So it might contain something interesting. 
and if we cut it, we indeed see that it contains a password hash for the user root. Let's try cracking it with John. If it's a secure password, this would not go anywhere, but John already tells us that this is using quite a shoddy password hashing algorithm that is limited to 8 characters. And after a couple of minutes, we get the cracked root password, iSmart12. Sweet! Now, let's look at the startup of the system. The scripts that run during boot can often be found in etc init.d. On this system, there's just a single script here, rcs. And if we open it, we can see that during boot, this machine does something quite interesting. It seems like the camera is running Telnet, which could allow us to log into the camera remotely using the password we just cracked. So let's see if it's actually running on the camera. Now I've set up the camera on my network, and if I try to Telnet into it, I'm getting a connection refused. And also if I port scan the camera using Nmap, we can see that there are no common open ports on the camera. Let's grab the extracted firmware for Telnet D and see if maybe it gets disabled somewhere down the line. And indeed we see iCamera contains the string Telnet D. And if we run strings on it and grab for Telnet, we see that it might kill all Telnet D processes. Luckily there are some workarounds. If we check where Telnet D comes from, we can see that it's just a link to BusyBox. BusyBox is a tool collection for embedded systems. We will see more of it later in this video. Now a trick with BusyBox is that you can not only use symbolic links, you can also invoke BusyBox and then tell it which tool to run. So if we change the contents of RCS uh, to call BusyBox Telnet D instead of just Telnet D, it should start as it won't get killed by the iCamera binary. Now that we have changed something in the SquashFS1 file system, we need to generate a new firmware image with our modifications. So far we have only modified SquatchFS1, so we need to only repack that single file system. SquatchFS has a lot of options, such as block size and compression. To make sure we get these correct, we can look at the output of unsquatchfs-s on the original SquatchFS. Let's use the values unsquatchfs gave us and create a new file system from our directory using make squashfs. Once this is done, we should have a SquatchFS1 new file containing our new file system. Now we need to combine the kernel, our new file system and the other file systems into an image. So let's add a pack functionality to the script. This script will open the supplied destination file, read in all the firmware parts from the file system, zero byte pad them to the right size so we don't change any offsets and write it all to a new file. You might notice that we only start with a second entry in firmware parts. That's because we will use a different tool to generate the image header. Back in the terminal, let's move our SquashFS1 new file to SquashFS1 and run our just updated script with the pack command. We will create a demo backdoor.binary. With this new file, we are almost done. All we have to do is generate the missing image header using a tool called makeImage. For makeImage, we need a lot of options, but luckily running binwalk on the original image header gives us all of them, so we can just fill them in and hit return to generate a new image. If we run binwalk on this newly created image, we can see that the output of it looks almost identical to the first run of binwalk, and so we hopefully have succeeded in creating a valid firmware image for the device. So all that is left now is to copy the image to a blank FAT32 formatted microSD card. To upgrade the firmware, I simply have to plug the microSD card into the bottom of the camera. Uh, this is a bit fiddly, but with a micro USB cable or some small plastic thing, you can easily push it in. Then you have to press and hold down the button while connecting the USB cable. As soon as the small LED next to the USB port turns blue slash orange, the firmware upgrade is running and you can let go of the button. This will not delete the configuration. And after a couple of minutes and a lot of blinking of the LED, the camera should be back to normal. So let's see if we can log into it using Telnet. And indeed, using the previously cracked iSmart12 password, we can now use Telnet to log in as root on the camera. And if we check etc init.d rcs, we can see our Telnet modification. So we have just successfully flashed a compromised firmware on this device. 
Now, in most networks, the camera will not be directly exposed to the internet, and so we can only log into it while we are on the same network. So let's put a small reverse shell on the device that makes the camera connect to a server of ours, which will basically act as a small command and control server. A common way to do this is to use netcat, but as you can see, we don't seem to have netcat, and if we check the available busybox commands, we can see that this system was indeed not built with netcat. Luckily, Busybox has pre-built binaries on their website, including statically linked MIPSL binaries, just what we need. Unfortunately, it's also relatively large with 1.5 megabytes, and we don't have that much space left on flash. But luckily, the device creates a tempfs, a file system that is kept in RAM and gets deleted on every boot. We can build a script that downloads Busybox to RAM on each boot and then uses it to connect to us. So let's create a bin backdoor script in our root file system. This script will first try to ping google.com once every second to determine whether the device already has internet. And once an internet connection is established, it changes the directory into slash temp and downloads busybox. If you are wondering about the strange IP, it turns out that wget on this system does not support HTTPS, so I had to upload busybox to a regular plain text HTTP server. Once we have our busybox downloaded, the script goes into an endless loop where it will try to connect to a small server I've rented on the Amazon cloud and exposes bin sh to the destination server. If the connection fails or is closed, it will try to reconnect after 120 seconds. We also need to add a call to our backdoor into the RCS startup file, and so let's comment out our call to busybox telnet and instead add a call to our backdoor. We also have to set the executable permission on our backdoor script. Now we can just again repack the image, copy it to an SD card and flash it. To repack the image, I will just recall the earlier commands. So I'll call make squashfs, then move squashfs1 new to squashfs1, call our wise extractor script with the pack command, and finally call make image with the same arguments as before. Now I just copy the firmware to a micro SD and upgrade the firmware in the camera. Meanwhile, I'll connect to the Amazon instance, which is our command and control server, and start netcat in listening mode on port 4444. And hopefully our camera should connect after a couple of seconds. And here we go. We have a simple reverse shell onto the device. As you can see, we can access recorded video, read out things like the Wi-Fi credentials, and access the rest of the internal network. Now imagine if you send this camera back to Amazon or sell it somewhere. A non-IT security savvy end user will have almost no chance of noticing that his device was backdoored. I hope you enjoyed this video and to see you soon on this channel again. Thank you.